Thank you all for joining us for our second Digging In of 2022. We're really excited to hear from our three local experts to discuss how the bald eagles at the National Arboretum fit into the greater Anacostia watershed and DC community. But uh, before we get started, we're gonna go through some housekeeping things. Uh, really fast, uh, this event is being recorded so we can share it with our greater audience afterwards. Um, as you all know, this event is free for our FONA members uh, to join in live, so thank you for joining us. Uh, please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation and add any questions or comments you have to the chat. There will be a Q&A at the end. And some quick updates from FONA and the Arboretum. Um, the spring, or the Arboretum is open every day, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our spring traffic plan has been lifted. Uh, so all roads and trails are open again to the public uh, for pedestrian and driving access, except for the trails and road directly around the azalea collections. And that's due to our favorite pair of nesting bald eagles. Uh, and there are a few trails in Fern Valley that remain closed to renovation. So please just keep that in mind as well. And we do have some really exciting upcoming events uh, at FONA um, this summer. Let's see, one second. Um, on, June, on Saturday, June 11th, we're hosting a 50th birthday party for our Washington Youth Garden. This is a free family-friendly event in the garden during the day. And then the next day on Saturday, June 12th, we're hosting an evening benefit in Washington Youth Garden, also celebrating the 50th anniversary. And this is a casual ticketed fundraiser in the garden to raise money uh, for the next 50 years of the garden. Um, on Sunday, June 19th, we're hosting a Juneteenth in the garden uh, event to explore the foods of the African diaspora. Um, on Saturday, June 25th, uh, we're hosting a summer 5K walk and run. On Wednesday, July 13th, we're co-hosting a movie in the meadow with the French embassy. And then on Wednesday, August 10th, we're hosting a evening summer concert with the US Navy band. And you can check out our phone of field notes and our membership newsletters for the um, for those registration links and any membership discounts um, that you all receive as being members. So keep an eye on that. All right, so to get into today's program, let's see, to get into today's program, um, phone is digging in as our virtual event series where we host experts and discuss exciting topics pertaining to the National Arboretum. Today, we'll hear from Sue Greeley, a field technician at the Arboretum, Dan Rausch, fisheries and wildlife biologist with the DC Department of Energy and the Environment, and finally, Rodney Stotts, master falconer and raptor specialist with Rodney's Raptors in Southeast DC. So we're gonna start out with Sue Greeley. Um, Sue is a field technician at the National Arboretum's research unit. She brings 33 years of National Arboretum experience to our work as a certified arborist and wildlife manager. And Sue's gonna give us a quick update on the state of the Arboretum's eagles right now. Sue, I will hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, unfortunately, my camera's not working right, so you will have a blank screen. Just a brief update on DC9. He is currently roughly eight weeks old. He has been hitting all of his milestones on target, so we are optimistic he will pledge successfully. He has recently started mantling his food that's when he will spread his wings and sort of hunch over. I don't know if Dan and Rodney have a better description to protect the meal from being stolen. He has started doing his wing exercises, flapping, hopping about to build flight muscles. Um, between nine and 10 weeks old, his next major milestone is to be branching, which is where he will actually leave the nest itself and end up on the lateral branches up and in around the tree. Um, and then after that, his final milestone between 10 and 14 weeks will be to fledge. Once he has fledged successfully, we will reach out to Fish and Wildlife Service. They will confirm that he is landing properly. That is of a concern for new fledglings that they nail the landing before we actually open the road. Um, as some of you may remember, DC-7 felt, well, unsuccessfully fledged and then ended up being rescued by Dan as he left the Arboretum and was subsequently diagnosed with West Nile virus and did not survive. So the concern of opening the road too early after fledging is that they end up on the ground and somebody's loose dog or child or whatever Become, comes in contact with him. So Fish and Wildlife will give us the thumbs up to open the road. 
And that is expected mid to late June at the earliest. Um, transitioning over to our partnership with DOEE, we have been working with the DC wildlife biologists for a number of years, conducting various surveys between turtles and salamanders and frogs and our mammals and most importantly, our birds. Dan has been an awesome partner, an amazing, um, knowledgeable person. He's dedicated, extremely talented. He is the DC ornithologist. It's been a pleasure to work with all the biologists with DOEE. The surveys that they conduct only enhance the Arboretum's knowledge and uh, DOEE's dedication to keeping the wildlife in district healthy and active. So I will hand that over to Dan unless somebody has a quick question. All right. I am done. So it's up thank to you, you thank, Dan. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate all that. <laughs> Good morning. Um, the, the, the question was, at least that they asked me to talk about today, is kind of how bald eagles fall into monitoring the environmental health of this section of the Anacostia River and just the area as a whole. So when you're, when you want to get a good idea of just what's going on, either on the surface or underneath of an ecosystem, um, it comes down to monitoring. And you really want to look at different tropic levels. So there's sampling going on in mussels that are being put out by AWS on the river. Um, soil samples are being taken from different parts of the marsh um, across the river at um, Kenilworth North and Kenilworth South, which are um, contaminated brownfield sites. And we also look at, uh, they're also taking samples in fish. And for us, um, and with DC9 a couple of weeks ago, it was an opportunity to get some data on a bald eagle chick that's feeding out of this area. So as a whole, um, there is a bald eagle nest survey route that's part of the National Park Service um, with US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and they kind of have an area which covers from um, just north of Route 50, where it crosses the Anacostia River, and it goes all the way down to Piscataway and then across the river to Mount Vernon. So that's kind of the, the survey area we have as our sector. So every March, they do an aerial survey and try to count the number of nests um, that are active. Uh, we also will fly over and check um, nests that are were used before to see if they're active or not, see if we're having nest failure rates. And then we also look for new ones. Um, so we this year, we, were, we had extra time. So we actually went up, um, not up just the Anacasi, but they took us up uh, Great Falls and um, there are two nests that are actually ones right at Great Falls and a sycamore tree, and then one's just on Bear Island and another sycamore tree. So sycamore trees seem to be pretty playing a pretty important role um, on the Anacostia River and the Potomac River for our eagles. Um, so once we have an idea of how those, those nests are doing, it only really gives us some pretty basic information. You know, we know if uh, they fail or not, we don't know why. Uh, maybe a partner, um, you know, met some untimely end. Uh, could be, you know, anything from, you know, sometimes uh, Excel train, you know, it's moving over 90 miles an hour and they can't get out of the way. That happens. Um, so we have, you know, there are power lines. There are, you know, eagle to eagle um, interactions, which are always, uh, sometimes negative. So um, we don't know what, exactly why those nests fail, but, you um, we did, were able to take a blood sample from DC9 this year, just kind of give us idea, is there something there that we don't know about? Because we really don't have um, any data on contaminant levels on the other eagles in our area. Um, we, there is some work done from the USGS um, about Osprey. So um, what we did is we took that blood sample, we ran it up through uh, the labs at UPenn, and I, we did get some results back. And I don't know if you guys have seen those or not, but uh, it was tested, we only tested for heavy metals. Um, at the time of the blood draw is either a, you know, the expert who was doing the blood draw, it was under his discretion whether he had time or enough blood and wanted to go for uh, sampling for organochlorines, which could be like PCBs, DDT. Um, he didn't really feel he had time to do that. So we were only really able to get one sample of serum 
of actually of whole blood to sample for heavy metals. So we sampled for arsenic, cadmium, lead, which is uh, really big when it comes to eagles and impairment, um, thallium, and the last one was selenium. And all the levels except for selenium came back as what they would consider background. So sublethal, not really impacting reproduction. Um, you know, they're, they're feeding out of the Anacostia River. And so there is going to be some kind of, of metal contamination there. So those all came out fine. The selenium was a little raised. It was uh, 0.732 parts per million. Um, but so we talked to the USGS and Barnett Ratner out there who's doing a bunch of work with Osprey on the Chesapeake. And it fell within the lower range of what he finds in uh, reproductively successful osprey. So that was great to hear that, you know, we didn't have a spike of some kind of contaminant we didn't know about um, impacting uh, eagle reproduction. So that was really helpful. So the point is now that, you know, this gave us kind of a jumping off point. So it's, we're at a spot where, you know, we know we've got between 15 and 20 eagles nests in our sector every year. Um, do we start sampling some of those other chicks? Uh, if we had found probably a spike in one or two metals in this, we it be uh, you know a guide to go ahead and do that. Um, we did not get organochlorines, which is it was unfortunate. But um, <laughs> I've been debating this. It's hard to get up there and get an eagle, um, especially I was ground checking nests um, after the flyover. We GPS them, and I go back and try to find them, and I know where they are. I've got a GPS point. And after leaf out, seen into a nest from down below is, is nearly impossible. Uh, I was able to get a couple and I knew where some chicks were. Um, the, the one down Oxen Cove has two. I found some others at Dyke Marsh that had chicks in them, but it's really hard to see in there. Um, so we have something maybe we can use as a substitute. So I'm gonna to talk to the USGS about it, about you know using Osprey as a surrogate. Um, they're feeding um, in the same area. We um, Rodney was talking about ECC. So ECC, what was this, about 10 years ago, put backpacks, uh, radio backpacks on a couple of males off the South Capitol Street Bridge. And it was cool to watch how they would separate their feeding areas. Um, they were very distinct. They would not cross um, into others areas. So we kind of know um, they feed locally, at least here. They stay in their sectors. So we'd have an idea of what contamination is in that certain area. And they're a lot easier to get to instead of um, you know going up a, 86 foot tree. Um, there's a lot of osprey nests that can be reached by boat on channel markers. And at least there's, uh, I know there's nine of those that could probably get to in an afternoon instead of, you know, one or two eagles nests a day if you can get access to them, which is really difficult. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we know if, you know, we will see contamination at lower levels, but we really want to know whether stuff bioaccumulates as they consume um, different fish sources and all the, you know, um, an eagle's diet's a little more varied. And as that goes up through the levels, are we going to see that by accumulation in, in the young? Are we going to have more nest failures? So that's kind of where we are using them as a monitoring tool. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we did have a question from, um, from someone beforehand. They like, you know, submit a question and they asked, what is the relationship between eagles and osprey and how do they affect each other's breeding and feeding areas? So you said that the males of like, what was it the male osprey or like the, the birds of each species do not necessarily like overlap their niches, but like between the species, do they overlap at all? So um, osprey are 99% fish eaters. So that's going to be their basic diet. The osprey are a lot more opportunistic. I'm not actually the bald eagles. Also, um, you know, our osprey migrate. So they're only here from, you know, early March to usually by August they head out. So they, they're only here for a certain amount of time. Our eagles tend to, to stick around. They'll be um, short distant migrants. I think they, they, they estimate maybe 280 miles is usually as far as they go. So they kind of stick around. So they're going to be our here year round. We know there are several pairs that have nests that actually will, will roost together all year. So they're, you know, so they stick around. Um, there are interactions between them. Usually there's enough fish resources out there to support both the osprey and the eagles, but uh, the osprey are better fishermen. Um, they are successful, you know, 60, 70, sometimes 80% of the time. Bald eagles are more 50-55. Uh, so sometimes you'll see osprey catching fish and the bald eagle will come in and harass them and try to get him to drop it. So um, 
and they're still using the same resources. They still want waterfront property for their nests uh, in order to be close to that food resource, but they seem to be able to occupy the same areas. Um, the osprey territories are much, much smaller and uh, the bald eagles need a lot more room. Awesome, thank you. And let me see, and we did have another question before, before we move on to Rodney. Um, the, someone had asked what's the particular history or what is the history of this particular nest? Who has lived there and how many eaglets came each year? I know Rodney was mentioning before about, uh, before folks got on about the number of, you know, eaglets most uh, pairs will, will have in years around two and three, or like you can, the average can be up to two. Three is usually really rare to have three eaglets in a nest. But um, I guess like for the Arboretum's nest in particular, has it always been uh, Mr. President and the, the associating female? It used to be uh, the First Lady and now it's Lotus. But um, I guess, is there more history behind that nest beyond that? So yeah, so um, Mr. President and the first female, the, fir the, the First Lady first uh, like paired up together in the fall. I think it was November of uh, 2014. Um, he'd stuck around here all summer. Uh, be feeding at the Arboretum and at Kingman Island and Kingman Lake. And he'd been there since uh, I think I first saw him in June uh, and stuck around. And she showed up in uh, late October, early November, and they started pair bonding by flight. Um, they flew together for several days and they kind of disappeared. And then it was someone at the Arboretum and those was a nest in the Azalea collection. Uh, so those two uh, had been together and successful. Um, they had seven chicks together. Um, except for th this is why. This is DC9. This is the ninth chick. So they were did not lay last year. And then when they stuck together all winter and she came back for this year as a full adult, then she laid two eggs. DC eight didn't make it, she didn't, it didn't survive the hatching process, but uh, DC nine is looking awesome. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for those answers. And uh, Sue, I've got one quick question for you um, before I move to Rodney. Um, what other foods besides fish do, uh, do you see the Arboretum Eagles eating? Uh, they have had a variety of ducks. They had a gosling one year. They often have squirrels, raccoon, um, groundhogs have been in there quite often. They've had some seagulls. Unfortunately, they're also bringing in rats and Dan can elaborate or not, but there is concern about the anticoagulants and rat bait impacting the eagle population. I believe there's been several studies out recently Fish and Wildlife Service is looking to analyze these more urban suburban nests in the food sources, particularly the mammals coming in and how the second generation anticoagulants can impact the survivability of the nests. So we don't mind that they take the groundhogs. The squirrels are whatever. <laughs> we're we're kind of hoping the feral cat population continues to decline. The coyotes are helping with those, but there are a couple nests in Pennsylvania that have been known to bring in cats. Um, but mainly if the river is too high or muddy, it is squirrels, groundhogs, a couple gulls, and a duck or two. Okay, thank you for answering that. And I know I know the koi pond at the Arboretum is a uh, is close pickings. Have they gotten into that much at all or? Um, the, sadly, the koi in the Anacostia may have inadvertently been part of our excess decades ago. We would dispose of our excess. Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens has some koi in their holding ponds, their aquatic holding ponds. So the koi that do come in the nest are actually either taken from the river or taken from Kenilworth. The koi around our administration building, due to the proximity of the buildings and the fountains and the number of people, it is not conducive to an eagle flying in and grabbing out of that the aquatic garden around the building. The herons have no such compunction about. They will stand along the roof edge now that the koi are back, they will start coming back 
and they will just hop down and wander through the pool taking the fish. So the heron are much more of an issue for our koi than the eagles will be. All right, good to know. That's something that I've been wondering uh, all season as I've seen the, uh, as I've seen the, uh, the live feed. Um, I believe campus. a couple koi have already made it through the nest. <laughs> Yes, I think yes, there was <laughs> a very large gold one, and then there was an orange, bright orange one. And so, no, those are actually coming out of the Anacostia or out of the Kenilworth holding ponds that are closer to us than the beaver dam pair. Interesting. Okay. So it was, it was last, last over the winter, I was at across the river at Kenilworth North, and uh, a peregrine falcon had caught a ring-billed gull. And seconds later, Mr. President came and kicked it off the gull and took it. Um, so they are, yeah, he's got a very diet and he'll take anything he wants pretty much. Wow. Yeah. Especially, especially with, uh, with, a, a mate and young to feed, um, no doubt. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, we will, as I said, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat and then we'll, we'll come back, um, at the end and do a more full Q and A, but, um, I wanted to move on, uh, to our third speaker, Rodney. So thank you, Sue and Dan. Um, but uh, to introduce Rodney, Rodney Stotts is a mouse, uh, master falconer and licensed raptor specialist from Southeast Washington, DC. Under his organization, Rodney's Raptors, Rodney creates interactive and educational programming, um, allowing adults and children of all ages to experience the excitement that comes from holding a live bird of prey. He is also a staff member of the Earth Conservation Corps under their Wings Over America division and a youth community leader, creating transformative opportunities that connect young people to the environment and their community. Rodney's love for um, falconry stems from the fact that it helps to keep the local raptor po population healthy while um, also crossing all color socioeconomic and ethnic boundaries. Uh, through Rodney's work, he makes a powerful connection between endangered species and local youth who must navigate survival in a stressed community. Well, um, thank you, Rodney, for joining us. Um, we, uh, to get started, um, can you please talk a bit about what you do now in your work with Rodney's Raptors? Oh, and you are on mute. Hold on one second. Let's get you off mute. Hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Awesome. Oh, okay. Thank you. I said thank you for having me. Well, what I'm actually in the process of doing now at Rodney's Raptors is I'm opening a human sanctuary called Dippy's Dream down in Charlotte Courthouse, Virginia. And it's a place where you can actually come and fly birds and ride horses and goats and feed chickens and play uh, softball and pitch horseshoes and just get away from the city and be able to connect back with nature. You got little trails that you can walk down and there are certain birds that are there that are not native up here. So I have people that come down there and they tell me about these different type of finches and woodpeckers and stuff that you won't find other places. I have no idea what these birds are because I love raptors. However, they get super excited about it. So it just makes me happy. So that's what I'm in the process of doing now. It's the place where you can actually come and camp out and spend the weekend and get out of the city. And it's all donation based. So it's no set price for anything because you can't afford something doesn't mean you don't deserve it. So if you don't have a thousand dollars to learn how to ride a horse, does that mean you don't deserve it? It just means you didn't have it. So if you got down there to Dippy's Dream and you had 75 cents in your pocket, you got to learn how to ride a horse. So it's, it's, a, it's a place to be able to come and connect back with animals, with nature to heal, because we all go through something every day. And that everything I've ever been through, there's been an animal there that helped me get through. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's incredible. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, kind of what's led you to, to what you're doing now with, uh, with Dippy's Dreams and, and where you started with Earth Conservation Corps, because that, that organization is, is what brought the Eagles uh, to the Anacostia and did a lot of the rehabilitation work to make the Anacostia something livable for raptors like osprey and eagles and all these other birds. Can you talk a bit about that and your experience? Sure, one of the first projects that we had was Lower Beaver Dam Creek, which is a tributary to the Anacostia, that we pulled out over 500 tires, car engines, motorcycles, couches, TVs, you name it, it was dumped in this 
um, and it's a little tributary. So as we started cleaning it, you started seeing turtles and great blue herrings and minnows and all these things coming back. So we kind of felt like mothers, like we were giving birth because all this new life was coming back. So to see um, all of the things that was going on, see the life and stuff that was coming back just inspired us to want to keep doing it more and more and more and have all the other things come back. So as we started cleaning the Anacostia, we were talking about the bald eagles not being nesting there in over 40 years. So, but some of the work that we were doing, we were trying to figure out would the Anacostia sustain life again. We were able to start getting four eaglets each year for four years. And we had a hack box at the National Arboretum, actually. We were hoist, we hoisted a hack box up in a tree. We would hoist fish up, shake a little line, which would drop the fish down so we didn't imprint the birds. And we, like we said, we do the eagle release. They would hop out. Um, as the lady explained that earlier, they would be branches basically, and then they would fly off because after so much time of sitting in that box, they could only build their wings up so much. But once they were able to fledge and successfully fledge off, that was it. And to be a part of it at that time didn't really make a difference. I didn't really see the significance of it. Now, all these years later, knowing what those eagle, who those eagles were named after each year that we released those eagles for core members that were murdered, that started this program with us, and to know that that legacy carries on and it all started from them, and to be a part of that is a true blessing. Yeah, can you can you talk a little bit more about that and and the community that you've built, um, or that like you know. The, the, I mean, working in conservation, the community that you build while you're out there and, and the significance of like, you know, the people that you were working with um, and who else was in Earth Conservation Corps, like what did it mean uh, for, for everyone, you know, in that cohort to be working on conservation in the Anacostia? Like, what did it mean for you? Well, I can't tell you what it meant for everyone else. I can just tell you what it meant. I can tell you what it did for us. For the people that came from the different backgrounds and experiences and everything that we had, that was the one thing that all of us could have in common. So no matter what our differences was, that was the thing that brought us together. By the end of everything before uh, Monique was actually murdered in 92 when we started, we had become this family in a three and a half, almost three month program basically, that was stronger than our family that was our blood that we grew up with basically. And it was all because of nature, no matter what happened, us being in the river, us being in the creek, us saving crayfish in the tires. I mean, these little things that you never paid any attention to was bonding us in ways that we had no idea that it was actually doing. And as we grew later and it started going and we started realizing and looking back, understanding that the family that was created came from that connection and that love of nature, that love of animals, that love of just seeing things bloom and blossom the way they supposed to without us being the thing that killed it. 99% of everything that gets destroyed is from us, humans, we did it. So to see something coming back and being a part of it was beautiful. And just like certain neighborhoods that we would go to, people would come outside and they would I mean, what are y'all out here for, man? Y'all wasting y'all time. And I, then they, as they seen us coming back, consistency, coming back, come, they would cook, make us lunch, bring us out lemonade. I mean, all sorts. So now that whole community became involved in a place that nobody even paid any attention to that you live next to for 10, 15, 20 years. They now kept it up. So you can go back to certain places now and it looks just as beautiful now as it did when we started it because the people now make sure that that's a part of their community that's something that they treasure because like i said we kept coming back no matter how much everyone would come out every day telling us you know we're wasting our time and you know the people ain't gonna like this and this, this. now the next thing you know you see them out there planning putting up um monarch butterfly guard resting places and things of that nature stuff like that so to know that I had some small part in there is a blessing. Yes, ma'am. 
I, I think we can all say, I think you've had more than a small, a small impact on the DC community and, and, um, and, you know, back then and, and cleaning up the Anacostia, but, you know, working with youth now, um, and adults, um, and, and connecting people to nature was, was your first time, I mean, did you always like have a connection to nature and, and like an interest in wildlife before Earth Conservation Corps or, um, or was it really through that program that you, that you built this interest? I've always loved animals. I don't, far back as I can remember, I've had every lizard, frog, salamander, snake, something. I've fished, dogs, white mice, hamsters, germ. I've always loved animals. I don't really like people. We're the only species that swear we're dominant over everything. We can't admit when we're wrong. I mean, all of those things, animals make you earn their trust. We give it out too easily. And then I can meet you today and tell somebody tomorrow, oh, that's my friend. I don't know you. That animal makes you earn that trust. It doesn't care if you're white, black, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, gay, straight. It doesn't care about any of that. All it cares about, do you love me? Or are you going to take care of me? People, you can show all the love and support and they still stab you in the back. I've never had an animal to bite me. Once we built our bond and that mutual, I've never had an animal that did anything to me that was my, that wasn't my fault. So that whole thing about, I've always loved them. It, this program just steered it more towards birds of prey. And as far as animals are concerned, horses, dogs, I have three dogs now. I've always had dogs my whole adult life. I have uh, goats and chickens. And I mean, you just, I've always had animals. I just love to go out and sit and talk to them and hear them talk back. Because I always explain to people, if you use your eyes to see and your ears to hear, you're deaf and you're blind. Do you think David Copperfield really walked through the Great Wall of China or made the Statue of Liberty disappear? No, he's an illusionist. But when you saw that, your eyes made you believe that that's what actually happened. No. So if you close your eyes and close your ears and just listen with your heart, you can hear every single thing that that animal that loves you is telling you. So my animals mostly are named after loved ones that I've lost. So whenever I'm feeling bad or at that point, I go grab one of them and I'm talking to one of them and they don't tell me what I want to hear. They tell me what they would have told me had they been physically sitting there beside me. So if I was wrong, they're going to tell me, no, Rodney, you're wrong. I'm not going to hear, oh, you are right, you right. You. Nope. So that's that connection. I try to explain to people. It's all in what you believe in. If it's not normal to believe that, then I'm just not normal. I love not being normal then. Let me be the most abnormal person you've ever known because I love this being able to hear them tell me back that they love me or don't do this or do that. It's a beautiful thing. All you have to do is just close your eyes, and close your ears, open your mind, open your heart. Trust me, you'll hear everything that they're telling you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, especially, yeah. Um, just, I, th I think that comes from just like a really deep appreciation and, and love of nature. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, what, what, made you decide then to work with raptors? What made you decide to get your master falconer, uh, you know, certification and license? What was that for you? What happened was working with Earth Conservation Corps, we had a raptor program where we were doing raptor education. However, we were only working with adjudicated youth. So when I went to them one day and I said, well, listen, the birds that we have are all injured, non-releasable birds, just like we are working with young people that have records and in the system, why can't we have birds before they get injured and save them and work with young people before they become locked up and into the system? They said, well, the only way you can do that is to become a falconer. I said, okay, well, I'll become a falconer. And then people started giggling and laughing. And like I told the biggest joke in the world because black falconer just wasn't a term, I guess that was heard 13, 14 years ago or something, I don't know. However, I just said, okay, well, since that's what I need to do to be able to work with people before they get in the system, because if we're talking about fighting the recidivism rate, don't if you stop someone from going to jail from the first place, there is no recidivism. 
So why wait for someone to get locked up and say, now you can come and we can work with you when I have an opportunity to do something that I can work with you before that happens. And hopefully it never happens. So that's why I, one of the main reasons that I became a falconer because I'd already been working with Birds of Prey for over what, 12 years, 13 years. Just the fact of wanting to be able to work with young people or anyone really before they became a product of the system, this was the route that they told me that I had to take. And when I told them, okay, it was like this challenge in a sense to do it. And that that's the one thing I love is a challenge. I, give me that. I have no problem with it. And so once that happened and then starting to see how it was affecting other people, because to me, it's just what I do every day. It's nothing special. It's, nothing heroic, none of that stuff. To me, the, the doctors and police and teachers, those are the heroes and stuff. Firefight, those are he. All I do is fly birds and talk to people. So to me, it's just normal, everyday, what I naturally would do. Seeing the way it affect people, the way it getting responses from people calling me a year later saying how their lives were changed after they held that bird and looked in his eyes and realized they can do anything and it, it gave them the courage to face things that they were afraid of and stuff like that. That's what means most to me. If I could pay bills with that, I'd be the richest man walking. I love that. Um, what has it been like for you to experience like those young people connecting with Raptors for the first time and to see that excitement in their eyes? You know, you said like they'll call you back, you know, a year later and, and say how much it's impacting them, but like, what is it like right in the moment um, and having that like that direct, you know, youth connection uh, through this conservation work? One of the things I explained to them when they first walk up and they all hunched up all hard and everybody's all this and, and now they got this bird, oh my God, oh, and they're jumping all around. And I say, ain't you embarrassed? Cause you were sitting there 30 seconds ago, like you was about to kill the world. Now look at you about to chill either. look at. And so now there's that ice broken and you see them just light up. And when you tell them at the end, especially the ones that were definitely afraid of birds and now they're holding a bird, you explain to them that what you just did was overcame a fear. It's bigger than just holding a bird on your hand. So if you approach everything in life that you are afraid of, with the same attitude that you approach facing this and holding this bird, tell me what you can do. And you just see, and then you're telling them how proud of you, how proud of them you are. And a lot of them just tears run down their face and they'll tell you they've never heard anyone tell them that they're proud of you. 18, 19, 20 years old. So it's more of a, a, a blessing and a curse because I'm so happy to see them and then curse to hear the responses that come back because it hurts your heart to know that all of this time, no one's told you this or no one showed you this. And all it took was a bird or having the horses when my horses were here and they would come and brush the horses and you would hear people saying, man, I've never been this close. Oh my God, I was so afraid. I thought they do this and they do that. And I've seen movies of, and all those fears get displaced and you show them there's careers in this, there's this in this, there's that. So you can always use nature because you'll always learn something new every single day that you're outside. In a classroom, to me, that's prison. You're constricted. Outside, you're gonna see something different. You're gonna get bit by something different. Something different is gonna crawl on you. You're gonna have some different experience every single day. And that's what's gonna keep you going because you, you thrive and to learn what else is out there, what else is out there, what else is and it just keeps them going. And once that passion hits them, it's up to us to put those programs and stuff in place for them. I don't like to inspire someone to do something and then there's nowhere for them to go. And that's another one of the other reasons why I started Rodney's Raptors, to try to have something, because I'm a falconer, I can take you out with me when I go trapping. I can take you out when I'm making ankleless and jesses. I can take you out on a hunt with me, things of that nature. So. It keeps you engaged, something else to do besides just saying, well, I got your interest, Pete. Now you're on your own. You know, so that's one of the main things that I, it, it for me, is more healing. I explain to people, I hurt from so much every day, missing people and things that 
So when I see someone else smiling, I can feel one of those loved ones saying, thank you. That's awesome. Um, I guess what, since you've kind of a two part question, we'll start with the conservation one. Uh, since you've started, you know, working with eagles and raptors, starting Earth Conservation Corps, what has been the biggest changes you've seen in the Anacostia watershed with, with the conservation work? And then I'll ask the second one in a second, what's the biggest changes you've seen in the DC community around this conservation work? But I guess like starting with the, with the Anacostia itself. Well, with the Anacostia, I guess more people, I, when I hear more about the eagles down there and the people seeing them, even, even the community period, just the DC, the buzz of it all now because of social media and the thing. So all of those things are great as far as that's concerned. To see them now, or when I go around certain places and I'll get phone calls from people that say, hey, is that your bird at such and such a place? I just saw your bird. And I explain to them, every bird in the world is not my bird, you know? So that part, and to know that you're connected, those people, the community where you came from, especially those communities around there where you grew up and now they see you and they know who you were. You was that little bad kid running around doing all these things. And this is something that you help, that they can now sit back and talk about with their grandkids and great grandkids. And I remember, and that little boy, and he was this and this, and now he helped do this. And now we got to, to hear all of that and see it and be a part of To me, it never really like, that in, I don't see it the way other people do, because like I said, to me, it's just something that I've always done. It's nothing that I ever looked at and said, oh, I got a book, or I did this, I helped bring the Eagles back, and we tagged the Osprey, and I, that's just a love of what I, it's my job, technically, that's what it, I always looked at it as, it was just a job, in a sense, that I love, so I didn't consider it work, so it doesn't, feel that same to me that others get and people will ask me these questions and I explain to them, I grew up down at Anacostia Park. So I never understood the thing of people saying the parks weren't used and the community underserved. You know, I didn't feel that way. I was in the park. We had cookouts and parties and roller skate, basketball, swimming. And, I mean, daily, there was bands at the park every summer, Malcolm X Day, all this stuff. So I didn't see it, I guess, in the way that the young people today do because they don't access it. They're on their computers and stuff like that. So if you're on your computer and you're talking about green spaces, get out and go to those actual green spaces and now talk to me. Because that's one of the things I think a lot of people, when, it, when I'm involved with it, I get passionate about it because I was there. I was in those rivers and creeks and streams and pulling this stuff out and almost drowning and having people grab hold of you because water come over your waders and now you're in six feet of water and you're about to drown. But you're sitting at home on a computer complaining about something. Go out and get active first. Now I'm gonna feel where you're coming from. So it's a, it's a big difference with me, I guess, because of the experiences. I hope I didn't ramble on because I, I, I kind of felt like I did. No, you're all good. That was that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, we did have someone ask, uh, can you tell us about some of the birds that you have? And specifically, they're uh, wondering if uh, if those birds have personalities. Yes, every single bird has its own personality. I have five Harris Hawks and a Goss Hawk. Harris Hawks are basically the wolf pack of the sky. They are the only bird species that'll hunt together. So they've learned that I can set up four, five, six birds together and they'll cooperatively hunt. I have a goshawk that when the time comes, you have to hunt this bird religiously. It stays hungry for some reason. And I mean, you have to constantly take them out and hunt. Every one of them is named after loved ones that have passed on. So each one of them do definitely have their own personality and I explain to people because of a species does something doesn't mean every single animal in that species does it just like migrating and things of that nature these are migratory birds but not every bird migrate migrates so you do have residential birds that won't leave and then you'll have the ones that'll migrate on back and forth 
but each one does definitely have their own personality. Some are sweet, some are real angry, some are spoiled. I mean, yes, each one has their own personality, yes. Awesome. Um, and then uh, Marie Jabbar is uh, wondering, is there a place where people can come and see your birds? Um, you mentioned uh, the place in Charlotte, I think it was where um, for Dippy's Dreams, but um, between Rodney's Raptors and Dippy's Dreams, like how, how can people see your work and support you and, and the thing that, you know, the things that you're doing? Well, um, as far as Rodney's Raptors um, support wise, you can go to Rodney's Raptors seeing me sometime i'm up in laurel on tuesdays and sometime on saturdays this is where my birds usually are i have um four of my harris hawks up here and my goss hawk is up here i have a red tail up here and i'll also be bringing an osprey and a barn owl or something up here along with the eurasian eagle owl so usually there's about four or five birds here at, at laurel because winter time comes, this is where I usually hunt them. And so repetition breeds acceptance. I can take these particular birds out at a certain time every year. They're gonna fly and do exactly what I want them to do. And 99% of the time, they'll come right back to you. So you have less chance of losing your bird. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we did have another question um, real fast. I know you mentioned, um, you, when you were in the process of, you know, reintroducing bald eagles into the into the DC region, you were getting, you know, a certain number of eggs each year and introducing them. But where can you mention again, like where you where you got those eggs from and why that was important? Um, there was a place in Wisconsin. I'm not exactly sure of the name, but they came from Wisconsin. Usually, when uh, eagles lay eggs, they lay two. On occasion, they'll lay three. So what they would do is the flyovers and see how many eggs were in that nest. So when there were three, they would take the uh, third egg out, uh, incubate the egg and the programs sort of like we were doing, reintroducing the bald eagles, trying to make sure that they can sustain life again. So we qualified to get the permits and everything to try to reintroduce the bald eagles to the Anacostia. So we had to continue doing work on the Anacostia every year um, actually just celebrated the 30 year anniversary, April 24th of doing work on the Anacostia, trying to make sure that it stays sustainable for eagles and osprey and all the rest of the animals to be able to strive and uh, live on the Anacostia River. So. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I know it, 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 it takes a village to, <laughs> to rehabilitate uh -huh. uh, something like the Anacostia. And, you know, we were talking about uh carp uh and, and koi from kenilworth it's you know getting into the anacostia in a place like the dc region and and you know all throughout the world it's hard to separate you know human impact from you know non-human nature and impact and um you, you really can't a lot of times but putting in the work i can't even imagine the amount of work you and all the other people in the community over the last 30 40 50 years have done to make the uh to make the Anacostia habitable for fish and, and plants and birds um, and the people living around it um, is incredible. So thank you. Um, and if folks have been putting some questions into the chat, um, if anyone has questions for Dan or Sue or Rodney, please put them in there and we'll go through them. But um, Rodney, I do, I do have a question. Is there anything else that you would like to, to talk about? Is there anything else you wanna mention before we get to the general Q&A? Um, uh, just read my book, I guess, and tell me what you think about it. I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, and your your book, uh, your book is Bird Brother, and it came out this year, right? Yes, February the third, I believe. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's awesome. It's um, and you also had a documentary released this year or last year as well, last right? Year. Last, last year, year called The Falconer. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> um, my, my question is, are you, how many people on your team, like do you have, do you have others on your team doing this or is this, a, is this just you right now? <laughs> team. There, there, there's no team. I oh. tell, I try to explain to everybody. There's not even a mom and pop operation. It's just a pop. I have to do everything. There is no team. Now, don't get me wrong. I do have a few people 
I can call upon when I, my back is against the wall that will be there to help me out. And as far as a team or someone who does this, I want, no, every booking, every everything, that's why I get so, send emails and stuff back that I don't know what's going on with, because it's just so much stuff and it just get all, I, no ma'am, there's no team. It's just, <laughs> when you that just was, oh no, you just told a joke, team, no <laughs> ma'am. You're you're doing a lot. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, well, kudos and thank Five you again. Plan, man. cutting down trees. I had to clear pasture land for the horses and where you'd be able to ride and put up aviaries. So I have to clear five acres of land so you can imagine an acre is about the size of a football field. So how many trees and stuff you have to cut down and scale back and do all and clear. So out of five acres, and all you have is a chainsaw and a weed whacker and a wood chipper. And you have to go and do all of that by yourself, basically. So each, you know, you're out there working to get the land together so that you can offer what you're trying to offer. And yeah, so it's no team. It's, it's yeah. just you. Yeah. Oh, man. Which is, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, even more impressive. You released a book this year on top of that. Um, and someone was asking where they can find the book. I know someone said they just bought it on Amazon, but um, where else can they find it? Um, Island Press is the people that released it, so I know they have it. Um, I think it was Barnes and Nobles and a um, few other bookstores or stuff. Yeah. If you just Google it, I believe it'll come up to um, whoever has it in stock or whoever it is that's selling it. I know um, it's at some kiosks or something at airports and stuff like that, and, and a few bookstores and stuff. I don't know um, all of them though. Okay. Yeah. I think, um, I think one of my coworkers just dropped the link, um, into the chat so people can, people can find that. Um, and I do have a question for, uh, for Dan and Sue and Ronnie, whoever wants to answer it. Someone did come to us with a question beforehand and it's just wondering, uh, where in the DMV area, can you spot bald eagles? Where, um, you know, where should people be looking? Uh, if people want to, you know, appreciate and observe all the hard work, all y'all have put into, you know, the conservation and, and uh, general conservation work, but the conservation work of eagles in the area. Where can people find them? Well, I'll tell you the truth. Now it's everywhere. I think to see my first one, I had to um, go out to Wyoming in the 70s. It was like, I think it was like 78, 79 to, to see a bald eagle. It's, it's rare. I didn't see one when I was in the field today, um, but I saw, you know, six yesterday. So um, they're out there, especially in a couple of weeks, you're going to see you know, the adults out flying with the young ones. So just, you know, keep an eye on the sky. Uh, they're flying there. You see the wings are completely flat. They're not like V-shaped or tilting like a vulture. You see a big seven and a half, eight foot wingspan. That's going to be a bald eagle. I've, I think I've been at like a baseball game at Nass Park and see several of them fly over out there with the Osprey. So it's just, uh, just, you kind of just, it's more about being aware. They are here. They're here now, which is awesome. And I just want to say one more thing. I've seen people like, come and see Rodney and walk away. And I'm sure he's not, he can't hear all the comments because usually people are talking to him and they are just in awe. They're all in awe of, of Rodney and, and just like the birds and his interaction with them. Um, so it's, it is really a, a special relationship he has and it's a special way he, he reaches out to youth that otherwise, you know, there might not be a way to, to make that connection. And Rodney's really found a, a fantastic like mechanism to unlock that, which is awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Nat. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Sue, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I'm good. I think that there's also winter population of eagles at the power plant. What's because the water, what's the name of it? Dan, help me out here. Well, uh, not DC water, but if you want to no, see it in down, the winter. It's, Near Southern Maryland or the Eastern Shore. Oh, Camingo Dam. Camingo yeah. Dam is one outside of Baltimore if you want to go up there. If you go down to yeah. Washington Sailing Marina in DC, I've seen uh, 18 out there during an Arctic freeze and they'll come down and they're, they were hunting coots and other ducks. Um, so we have a, a pretty good winter population. Not only ones that are nesting here, but we get, if it's, if it's really cold up north and the lakes start freezing, especially the Great Lakes, they push south. So we can get pretty big numbers sometimes. And our pair, our current pair, you can always come to the Arboretum and down, down to Kingman Island and see at least two eagles all the time. 
<laughs> that is very true. <laughs> well, one of the things I tell people is just look up. I don't know why people think birds walk around on the ground. <laughs> look up. You'll see them everywhere. They, like Dan was saying, now they're everywhere. You can go 295, ride on 295, uh, coming off where Virginia and DC meets. You'll see a bald eagle most of the time. I think it was at, um, I was at the parking lot at the Safeway over Carver Terrace, and I was walking out after getting groceries, and I just pointed up, and there were you know 20 people out there. Being, the eagles were circling right over them. Mm -hmm. They had no idea until they looked exactly. up. They were right there. That's why I people tell people, look up. Yeah, people can also check eBird and that that will help novice ornithologists or birders figure out where to go to look for specific bird species. eBird is a good app to help locate birds. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for those extra tidbits. Um, and I want to say Thank you, thank you, uh, Sue and Dan and Rodney for joining us today, for taking the time out of your, your day um, to join us and talk about um, you know, eagles and the Anacostia. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming today and I wanna pass it over real fast to Craven Rand, FONA's Executive Director to close us out. Well, thank you, Ann. Um, I wanted to give one brief public service announcement. Before I did that, I do wanna thank our speakers today, uh, starting with Sue Greeley. Uh, she has been a tremendous partner who's taught me a whole lot about wildlife at the Arboretum, uh, whether it's eagles or owls or bats, deer, duck, even the lanternfly. Uh, Sue will share not only what she knows about the topic, but also has passed along a lot of great content for other experts, um, which is a great transition to Dan Roush. Uh, Dan's work has been so important uh, to the district, but he's been so helpful to the Arboretum and Fauna as well. And uh, I think most of you probably remember that if you were on our first Digging In, Dan was a, a guest on that too. So many thanks to Dan. And I got to thank Rodney uh, for giving us time today. Um, I will admit that I was especially excited about Rodney joining us today because I recently watched his segment on uh, HBO Real Sports. Um, and if you want to learn more about Rodney in addition to the book and the documentary, um, I would certainly encourage you to search that out. Uh, it's a great story. Um, plus, it's with Bryant Gumbel, who is one of our, our great journalists and storytellers. Um, I just... Uh, Loved hearing about his, uh, your work with uh, the Earth, Earth Conservation Corps to help clean up DC waterways and bring the bald eagle back to, uh, to the area. It's just in such an important story. And you know, one can make the argument, we might not even have eagles at the Arboretum without Rodney's work back in the day. Uh, so many, many thanks to Rodney uh, for joining us and obviously to Sue and Dan uh, as well, but also to Ann McGarvey for planning this great event. Um, I've obviously been looking forward to it for a while with everything going on with the Eagles and uh, just so happy that uh, we put together a great event and thanks Dan for doing that. But obviously thanks to all of you for joining us as well. Your support is, is so important uh, to FONA and, uh, and to the Arboretum as well. Now, as far as the public service announcement, announcement uh, I did want to give one last plug for our upcoming benefit to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Washington Youth Garden on Sunday, June the 12th, along with the birthday party on Saturday, June 11th for, uh, for kids and families. It's going to be a great event uh, for the event, um, excuse me, for the uh, benefit on the 12th with plenty of delicious food and drink. Uh, plus, you'll be able to tour the garden and talk to our team about our work. And then we will also be premiering a special film about the history and the work of the garden that I know all of you would enjoy. Um, obviously, the, uh, the benefit is an important event because of the, uh, the milestone of the Washington Youth Garden, the 50th uh, anniversary. But we also need your support uh, to fund the important work that we do at the garden. And we're also in the midst of a long-term garden redesign that your support will help too. So I hope all of you will consider joining us for that special night uh, at the garden on June 12th. And uh, you can uh, visit FONA.org for more uh, details on the event. But again, many thanks to all of you for joining us today for your support of FONA. And uh, again, thanks to our, our, our guests for, for giving us time as well. I know they're all very busy and have uh, other things they could be doing, but to, to join us and share a little bit about their work, is, uh, it means a lot to us. So thank you again, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. And then I'll hand it back off to Ann for any closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a uh, just reminder to keep an eye out for future digging in events. Uh, this is a quarterly series for us. Um, and we just, like I said, we try to feature um, really cool speakers that pertain to the Arboretums and FONA's mission and, and our surrounding community. Um, and also sign up for FONA Field Notes, our weekly newsletter, where you get um, good 
uh, updates like our, you know, our regular Eagle updates and other upcoming events, but also we really like featuring um, our, our community friends and partners as well. So it gives you a good insight into the, into the DC community. But thank you again, everyone for coming and thank you to our speakers. And uh, with that, we can close out the event. Thank you.